My name is uh, Jackie Harris. Uh, a lot of you um, know me either from these conferences or uh, have seen us in clinic. Um, I am at uh, Kennedy Krieger Institute and Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and we're really glad to be here. And um, this is Dr. Eng. She'll uh, briefly introduce herself as well when she comes on. But we're going to talk a little bit about neurodevelopmental research in CAT 6A and CAT 6B syndrome. This is a slightly more focused talk than others we have given in the past, so uh, we're here to answer any questions and forgive us for flying through some of this stuff. So just to start with a little bit of background, so CAT 6A and CAT 6B are epigenetic disorders. So epigenetics is, describes mechanisms of the regulation of gene expression through DNA modification or chromatin alteration that does not involve changing the DNA sequence. So basically what that means is epigenetics affects the way that genes are made into proteins. And at the end of the day, that's the function of genes is to be made into, oops, be made into proteins and the proteins then carry out all of the activity within the cells. And there are several different mechanisms of epigenetic alteration, which we know about. There's methylation of the DNA itself, so placing a methyl group or removing a methyl group from the DNA strand. Histone modifications, alteration of the chromatin structure, so twisting around the actual DNA strand to make it more or less available to be made into proteins, and then RNA-based uh, alterations. And where we're going to focus is histone modifications. Both CAT6A and CAT6B are proteins that place acetyl marks on histones. Histones are the proteins that DNA is wrapped around inside the cells. All of our DNA is contained in almost every cell in our body. And there's no way that that could all possibly fit if the DNA was just laying out flat. So it has to be wrapped. And those things that are wrapped around are called histones. And histones are very, very active. They open and close to allow the DNA to be made into uh, proteins. And histone modifications, like the ones placed by CAT6A and CAT6B, tell those histones what to do. So the specific type of disorder that cat, both CAT6A and all the CAT6B related disorders describe are, we call them Mendelian disorders of the epigenetic machinery. So what that means is the Mendelian word means that these disorders are inherited in a Mendelian fashion. So the kind of genetics you know, that you got in high school and college and things like that, where you, know, you get either one copy from a parent or two copies or something happened newly, that's the type of inheritance that these, uh, these diseases have, but we call them epigenetic disorders because again, they affect a protein that places these epigenetic marks. And so these, uh, we divide these into writers, readers, erasers, and remodelers, depending on what the function of that protein is. And both CAT6A and CAT6B are writers, so they place an acetyl mark on histone. Um, these types of disorders, the Mendelian disorders of the epigenetic machinery, have several commonly shared features, including abnormal growth and intellectual disability or developmental delay. And when cons although each of these individual disorders, like CAT6A and CAT6B, are individually rare, when you look at the group as a whole, together they represent a pretty sizable proportion of genetic intellectual disability. So these types of epigenetic proteins or epigenetic machinery proteins are incredibly important for the functioning and developing of the brain and then later uh, for cognition and behavior. And so um, CAT6B, so CAT6B syndrome or CAT6B related syndromes are caused by a variant, usually de novo, which means a inherited, that means it happened newly in the child, not inherited from a parent, although we know it can be inherited from a parent in some cases, in one of the two copies that everybody has of the CAT6B gene. It causes overlapping but distinct syndromes. So um, one is called SBDYSS, 
One is called genito patellar syndrome, and then there are other distinct syndromes within CAT 6B related disorders that have overlapping signs and symptoms with these two uh, buckets. And one thing that we know throughout all the CAT 6B related disorders is that they are listed as having intellectual disability and behavior issues, but there's lots that we don't know. So CAT 6A, um, is uh, also called arbolated tan syndrome is caused by a variant again usually de novo in one of the copies of the cat 6a gene um, it also has a uh, number of characteristics but the primary characteristics are intellectual disability or developmental delay with a uh, profound speech and language impairment more so than usually the rest of cognition and CAT 6A syndrome has neurodevelopmental commonalities with other similar epigenetic disorders, but it also has features that are specific and unique to CAT 6A syndrome. And um, before I go into the specific neurodevelopmental cognitive and behavioral features that we have learned about, about CAT 6A syndrome, I wanted to quickly stop because this will be important for understanding the rest of the talk about CAT 6A or CAT 6B and describe some genetic terms that will be important to know. So when we are talking about changes to, for example, the CAT 6A gene, we often divide it into three categories and it's really two categories and then one of the categories has two groups within it so um, the first big division is truncating versus non-truncating uh, variants or mutations and so what we mean when we say that is a truncating variant is one in which the protein stops before it can be fully made and so um, we, we think of making proteins from genes sometimes as a Lego tower. So if you're building a Lego tower and you have the instructions on how to build the Lego tower and the instructions tell you to put a red four block somewhere, a truncating mutation, instead of telling you to put a, the wrong block in, will actually tell you stop, stop the whole tower, right? And so then what happens is if that happens very early in the protein, that's called an early truncating mutation, then the cell looks at that mutation and says, I don't know what to do with that, and throws it away. So it just puts that whole nubbin of a protein in the trash. That's an uh, early truncating mutation. And so basically with those, you get exactly 50% activity. One copy of the protein works totally normal. One copy of the protein doesn't even exist. The a late, so we're gonna pause on a late truncating mutation for a minute. And we're gonna go to the other type, which is a non-truncating mutation. So these are often called missense. We also include something called splice sites variants in there because splice sites are a little more complicated and we don't always know where to put them. But um, a missense is basically, instead of that red four block in the Lego tower, you have a blue two block. And so that definitely changes the, the look of the protein, it changes its stability, it might change the function of the tower, because if you need a big strong tower and you have a wobbly one, that's not so great. But you still may have some aspects, that tower may still be good for some things. And so those are, um, those are missense, those are the non-truncating variants. And then the late truncating variants, so back to a truncating, but this time it happens very late, so towards the very, very top of the tower. And so when that happens, the cell sort of looks at this, or at least what we think happens, is the cell looks at this and recognizes it as a tower, but that tower isn't right. And so that, and that tower is so not right and so, kind of uh, inappropriately formed that it can actually interfere with the good tower. So it actually interferes with the other copy. So that's late truncating uh, variants. And you're gonna hear us divide into these different categories, which is why I wanted to stop for a moment and go through that. So back to the features of CAT 6A syndrome. So um, it has several common features with other uh, Mendelian disorders of the epigenetic machinery, including intellectual disability, 
Hypotonia, that is the very worst in infancy usually, but it proves a bit when older, although still persists. Um, a uh, happier, friendly disposition, and lots of sleep issues. There are some features that are very unique to cats that say different than these other MDEMs. Um, the fact that expressive language and speech are most profoundly affected compared to their other developmental skills. Very significant oral motor function that doesn't get better um, with age that persists as a major problem. It has a higher prevalence of craniosynostosis than some of the other MDEMs or fusion of the skull bones, but fewer spine and vertebral anomalies than some of the other ones have. And um, it has very low rates from our studies of behavioral issues. Um, so early development um, for CAT 6A, uh, developmental milestones in CAT 6A are generally universally delayed. Gross motor usually improves over time, so they're less far behind, but things like walking can still be quite delayed, and again, that hypotonia persists. Uh, fine motor stays steadily behind throughout life. Social and emotional is sometimes a strength, and language we're gonna discuss more later. Um, children often look even more delayed in early childhood than they do later. This is due to the hypotonia and expressive language. So a child who is very low tone and can't express themselves really can't show us anything that they're thinking or can do, whereas an older child develops more functions to be able to show us these things. Um, it's important to have early engagement with therapies through infants and toddlers or some other mechanism. And the late truncating mutations that we've talked about, they seem to be the latest to meet their early milestones. So language, this is all uh, from a uh, really lovely recent paper by Angela Morgan's group. Um, so uh, speech and language are both significantly impaired in CAT 6A. Um, of this large sample that was looked at, 73% of them were minimally verbal, so really were not able to use verbal communication as their primary method of communication. Um, it also showed that Although the expressive language is the most obvious, that receptive language was impacted as well. Um, and that speech itself is almost universally a problem in addition to language function. So it's not all speech, it's not all language, both things are impacted in this syndrome. Um, the late truncating variants are more impaired than the other types of variants. And often, again, because we've just said 73% of these kiddos were minimally verbal, uh, AAC and other types of augmentative communications are necessary and should be implemented early when a diagnosis is made. Um, and now let's talk about intellectual disability in CAT 6A syndrome. So believe it or not, this is actually something we know less about. We know that it's present in all but one reported case of CAT 6A and that most are classified in the moderate to severe range, and that the IQ scores that we have published, the missense tend to be the highest and the late truncating the lowest, but we really don't know much about this intellectual disability beyond this. This is, this is very nice, but not actually particularly descriptive about what functions are difficult and what functions are better for kids with CAT 6A. And so um, clinically for your child, it's absolutely imperative to get good neuropsychological testing when it's available and good developmental follow-up and have kind of a cohesive team between school and medical providers. And um, we, you know, we wanna learn more about this intellectual disability. The other dimension of intellectual disability besides IQ scores is adaptive functioning. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this. The figure at the bottom is from the 2019 Kennedy paper. And um, it's just showing you how, when you look at just IQ scores or developmental delay, that the late truncating seems to be the most effective. So um, we went about undertaking a study in uh, behavior, sleep, and adaptive functioning to understand more about these in CAT 6A syndrome because these had never been looked at before. And um, we found some interesting things. So what we found is that adaptive function is really, really impaired uh, across the board. So um, they have trouble with almost every area of adaptive functioning um, and that um, while it wasn't significant that there is a trend towards the late truncating being most impaired and the, uh, the missense being least impaired, although again, 
this is this was not super significant. Um, they uh, what was interesting though is typically when you see kids with this low of adaptive functioning, you actually see lots and lots of really obvious um, uh, maladaptive behaviors, and we actually saw very little of that compared to what we would expect in the CAT 6A uh, population. So this is very interesting and very important to know. Um, Sleep, the other thing we looked at is what we saw is even without a high percentage of the thing that most physicians, most sleep medicine doctors really think about when you're talking about sleep in a child, which is obstructive sleep apnea, that kids with CAT 6A have significant sleep problems. They, are, they have sleep problems across the board and most of them have some sort of sleep problems even if it's not diagnosable as obstructive sleep apnea and treatable with surgery. And so um, these are uh, the kind of take home points from that basically low adaptive skills, low rates of behavior, much lower than we would expect and high rates of sleep disturbance. So the next step we wanted to undertake is to understand more about the profile of cognition beyond just the language, which I again, uh, Dr. Morgan's group had done a lovely job of characterizing. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. A. Hi. Um, I'm a, I admit some of you already. I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist over at Kenny Krieger. Um, yeah. And I've been seeing some families who are conducting some studies. So, as we talk a little bit about what we've done, some of you might have been seen last year in, uh, with our Kansas A study um, and some of our preliminary results so far. Okay. Um, so, over the past year, we've recruited about 15 individuals with confirmed diagnosis of CAT 6A syndrome. Um, and we looked to make sure that we have the, like that the, they have the molecular kind of pieces there, checked with their genetic test records. And what, so far, we could see about two of them had early truncated, 10 with late truncated, three in a sense. And so, you know, as we kind of go through some of the preliminary results, you know, we do take that caveat in mind that their, the representation of the group is more formally driven by the late truncated group. And, um, as Dr. Harris mentioned earlier, that there, you know that we know that there is a higher rate of my vision and hearing impairment or hearing impairment within the group within um, those with CAT 6A. And so one one person, one participant had a diagnosis of CBI uh, more than mine. And so um, with the idea in mind that we know a little bit more about the kind of differences in intellectual functioning across the different variants, and then also more recently kind of type papers from Dr. Morgan's group with regards to the language component also showing them somewhat of the similar trends with late truncating or truncating groups being more affected than non-truncating groups. We're, we're interested to look at now then is this kind of overall cognition being more all driven by the language or do we see a similar pattern also in a non-verbal kind of non-verbal um, cognition thinking about more visual spatial processing and um, non-verbal reasoning skills. And so we had all participants participate in this uh, right rate of test that includes more visual constructions thinking about more um, visual motor skills um, uh, visual reasoning skills, and then also kind of visual perception, so spatial perception, um, visual matching. And generally what we saw, when we look at this cohesively, collectively, as a non-verbal composite, we see this kind of trend, the yellow being the missense group, I said, sorry, that's a little small for that group back there, um, the red and, uh, being the late truncating group, and then the pink in the middle being the early truncating group, we generally see a pattern of the truncating groups performing with lower scores than the missense group. So generally, overall nonverbal skill seems to be more, um, a little bit um, more preserved within the uh, missense group. And when we looked at this broken down, whether based on the visual spatial or kind of the our reasoning skills versus the visual motor skills, knowing that there's also higher rates of motor difficulties within these um, CAT 6 group, CAT 6A group, we see the similar pattern across the, pa um, if you look at the bottoms across the below, the left side, the two on the left, are more kind of visual constructions, visual motor skills, <clears throat> so things like drawing, building blocks, um, whereas the right side two are more kind of like visual matches, um, spatial, re uh, spatial reasoning or spatial processing, which doesn't require motor-based skills. 
we see the similar pattern across um, both areas. So visual motor skills also showing that the truncating group overall just seems to be performing a little bit weaker than the missense group. Um, and similar in the visual spatial processing and visual perception that also that the truncating group generally are um, performing a little, a little bit lower than the missense, missense group. So far we have not reliably seen differences within the truncating group, meaning the early versus the late truncating group. Um, but that being said, again, we have much sm larger late truncating group and much much smaller early truncating um, group than we have, um, and so we take that in mind. Then we looked at just generally kind of receptive language, which is basically like kind of more language comprehension. Um, on the left, it is more comprehension of instructions, like how you're able to follow through oral directions. Um, and on the right, it's a receptive language. So it doesn't really, um, it requires you to basically identify a picture associated with a word. Um, and generally, we saw, it seems like that with the kind of broad, more language comprehension, um, that again, the truncating groups on the left um, are performing more, have shown some more difficulties than the missense group, which seems to be somewhat consistent with what some of the um, literature that Dr. Morgan's group is starting to come out. And but. That being said, we didn't see this consistently. So the receptive uh, vocabulary, we saw generally all groups performed similarly um, across the board. And then the other piece that we were also interested in, in thinking about non-verbal skills is kind of social cognition. Um, social cognition being kind of social processing skills. Uh, part of the reason why we're interested in this is also because that there's a little bit high rate, or rates of um, autism presented within those with CASIC say. But that being said, a lot of those who present with, um, with even with autistic um, spectrum features, they are very different in terms of the quality and the kind of presentation than what you would typically expect for kids with autism without the CAT6 syndrome. And so what we looked at was then um, kind of the, um, uh, that's the top on top where it, um, those are kind of looking at affect recognition, so how you're able to recognize process facial stimuli, and on the bottom, it's looking at how you're responding appropriately based on facial cues. So if you're on pre-rated phases are high trusting versus low trusting, approximately half of them being high trusting um, and low, half of them being low trusting, are you kind of what you would expect was about 50% then appropriate, like uh, appro um, uh, approachability rate, meaning that you were willing to befriend this person. Um, but when we looked at this, looking at it on top again, we generally see those late truncating or late truncating, but tr truncating variants generally um, are tend to show more social difficulties or social cognitive processing difficulties than those with um, missense groups. So again, processing faces, processing affect seems to be more challenging in those with late truncating um, late or truncating groups overall, but particularly in late truncating groups. But when we looked at kind of at, like similarly at approachability, meaning that how willing that they are to um, approach or willing to engage in someone based on facial cues, we generally see, and this is actually a flip. So what you would expect is that um, you, we, we want generally that you, for someone to be having um, less approachability because that would tell us that you are more understanding differentiation basically between faces. So you actually don't want too high approachability because if you are, then it tells us that you're basically approaching regardless of stimuli, right? regardless of the, the type of faces. And generally what we see is that the truncating groups seems to be at more um, at chance in terms of how they're approaching and willing to engage regard regardless of the facial stimuli, whereas the mid-sense group seems to have better differentiation in the way that they're actually engaging in behaviors based on facial stimuli. Um, and likewise, when we looked at questionnaires from parents um, asking families about what they're seeing in day-to-day -day kind of social behaviors, um, generally, unlike the testing, actually on day-to-day -day behaviors, it seems like families are generally reporting difficulties regardless of the variants. And this could be that, you know, when we're thinking about these questions on social behaviors, right, it includes, it's very non-specific in the sense that you might ask you questions like, are you able to make friends? And we don't know then, is it because of things like attention? Is it really because of the social cues? Or it's uh, like because of the communication difficulty? So, you know, I would take that, yes, that across all, all across the board that there might be a little bit more challenges with social kind of engagement, but we don't know this might not be a reflection necessarily of similarly of the social kind of cognitive processes. Okay. Um.
We also also had families um, fill out a questionnaire on executive functioning. So executive functioning being like day to day, how they're able to self-regulate, um, how they're being able to kind of it, um, uh, impulse control, um, adapt to situations, and um, show some flexibility in behaviors and or working memory, like um, like short term memory. And generally, actually, overall, um, for across the three groups, they perform. Like, parents are reporting similar difficulties. But that being said, the rate of difficulties that the cat six syndrome, um, a syndrome kids are showing, are less than what we would typically expect for those who have the same level of cognitive difficulties overall. So generally speaking, it seems like executive functioning are not, is an area that doesn't seem as affected, even though within, among those three groups that are reported similarly. Um, and so one of the big questions is then sometimes like we, we have is that, you know, well, was every child testable, right? Because some children may not be able to engage in some of the testing based on the level of developmental delay. So when we show all these test results, right, it might be biased in the sense that it does not it represents the children who are able to be tested, but not those who aren't able to test it. So we did want to then look at the across the groups who aren't able to be tested in these higher reasoning skills to begin with. And generally what we're seeing is that it's largely represented by those with the late truncating variants. And so most of the children who are able to test on these kind of higher reasoning skills on higher order reasoning kind of measures are tends to be um, gravitated towards more of a late trunking variant group than the other groups so overall what this the, these results so far tell us those um, those with truncating variants generally seem to show more greater difficulties with nonverbal cognition, visual motor skills, and social cognitive processing than those with missense variants. But on a day to day life, without regardless of the variant, parents are still reporting kind of some similar social difficulties and similar executive functioning difficulties. Um, but that being said, again, we need a larger sample of those with early trunking and distance variants because our group is much more uh, represented by late trunking variants. Um, and we also need for more kind of adaptive neurocognitive um, tools than, because those with kind of sensory motor difficulties, if you have more vision impairment, if you have more uh, uh, motor difficulties or motor impairment, may not be able to test in more of these kind of standard typical procedures, which makes it more limiting to kind of phenotype and to think about characterizing these differences. Um, um, and, but what we don't know, right, is also if the Cassic species uh, disorders will show these kind of similar or distinct kind of cognitive or neural behavioral patterns. And so, um, with that in mind, we are still like, collecting data for our, our Cat 6A syndrome, but we are now starting a new study where we're, um, that some of you might uh, know and some of you might be participating on the, um, similarly on this kind of battery of nonverbal kind of reasoning skills, behavior functioning, but with Cat 6B disorder families, um, children. Uh, we're also, for those who cannot um, participate in terms of testing because of time, scheduling, and whatnot, um, we are also doing retrospective studies of cognition for Cat 6B, which is basically for, for families who have had um, neuropsych testing or developmental testing that you can send in us our report so that we use that data in terms of being able to start to at least get a better idea of the cognitive patterns. So even if you can't participate and have your child tested, we encourage if you have had prior test assessments before to participate in that study. Um, and then eventually we're going to plan to move on to have a virtual study in terms of behavior uh, and functioning cassic speed disorders, which is basically having families collect um, co uh, collect questionnaires remotely and fill out about kind of their development. Um, so again, the latter two doesn't require you to come in in person, so ways for you to participate even if you might not be able to take the time to come in to schedule uh, testing for the next couple days, okay? And we just want to acknowledge um, support from the Foundation, um, the IDNRC, ICTRC, who provides us kind of testing support from the Kenny Krieger, um, uh, uh, and also Dr. Farner, um, our kind of the they're one of the um, geneticists over at uh, Hopkins who isn't here today. So. Um, any questions or?